How are you guys doing today? Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. My name is Anthony Ganji. Thank you guys for tuning in and welcome to my YouTube channel. It's growing. Got to get some more numbers there. So guys, don't forget guys, got to get to that YouTube channel. So if you're listening now, please subscribe and comment, engage. It's a, it's a channel meant for us in corrections. It's a great channel. Don't forget the other venues I have like iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spreaker.com, Player FM, Stitcher Radio, Corrections One, as well as um, the app. Download the app. It's free. It's on iOS and Samsung devices and also Facebook. Uh, we have a page on Facebook. Now, today's going to be great. I have an old time uh, friend on my show, my very first guest who I had many years ago, who's coming back to uh, uh, just kind of have some company with me because right now we have a lot to discuss because my boy Gary Cornelius, who's the guest on the show, has written this book, The Correctional Officer Practical Guide. Now, by the way, if you could see Gary right now, Gary would also be having one of my cups because I sent it to him because he has helped me get Tear Talk to the point uh, of where we're at, which is good. you got a good audience and people actually listen, which is great. Uh, but today I want to discuss the need for this book, the importance of this book, and just kind of like the evolution of, of corrections. But again, this book is a textbooks format. You can find it at Amazon. This is a great foundation if you are new to corrections, if you want to enter corrections, or if you're a senior in corrections, this book carry, uh it just, it just covers everything, literally everything, guys. It's a textbook that covers everything. And the key here is it's written by somebody with experience as well as somebody that teaches. So it's got a, got a great balance. But that's enough about me talking about Gary Cornelius. Gary Cornelius, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Anthony. And uh, thanks for having me back on. Uh, thanks for coming on, Gary, because I know you're extremely busy, especially when you write a book that's this thick. Um, but real quick, Gary, just to reintroduce yourself to my audience, can you uh, just elaborate on who you are, Gary? about the book. Uh, my name is Gary F. Cornelius. I uh, am a retired deputy sheriff lieutenant from the Fairfax County, Virginia, office of the sheriff, uh, 27 plus years uh, experience there. And uh, uh, I worked uh, in the, at the uh, Fairfax County Adult Detention Center. And of those uh, listening that don't, don't, do not know where Fairfax is, it's uh, it's uh, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., about 15 miles west of Washington, D.C. Uh, I started out in a, uh, an old red brick iron bar linear jail, and uh, through the years, my years there, the, the jail was added to several times, and we went from a, a, a jail with a capacity of 198 to a, a capacity now of in the 1200s, I think 1250, somewhere around there. Uh, the jail had uh, uh, linear, has linear, uh, modular, and direct supervision. It's a, it's a modern jail, uh, and uh, I I remember fondly my years there and the and the staff that I worked with. Some are still there. Some have retired. Uh, before that, I was a police officer for Herndon, Virginia. Before that, uh, I was an officer in the U.S. Secret Service. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My first job in law enforcement was uh, a police dispatcher for Allegheny County uh, Police in uh, uh, South Park, PA. Uh, I also uh, uh, am an instructor. I teach for four criminal justice academies in uh, Virginia. I, I teach about 15 uh, or so in-service, uh, different in-service classes, topics, plus if an academy asks me, uh, I'll help out with uh, basic jail officer training. And for example, yesterday, uh, uh, one of my really uh, great clients, the Hampton Roads Criminal Justice Training Academy in Newport News, I did a, a full class, a full day on uh, jail suicide prevention. And it's, it's fun to go in and teach the rookies. It, it really is fun to teach the rookies. I also teach uh, corrections courses at George Mason University, and I have a blog on Corrections One, talks about training. So, uh, and I do consulting and traveling. Anybody would uh, like to hear any of my classes or, or, or uh, ask me to come in and teach. Uh, I just, for example, I just did a, a class for uh, volunteers at the Arlington uh, County Jail in Arlington, Virginia. Nice, nice bunch of folks up there and uh, they asked me to come in and talk about manipulation to their jail volunteers because uh, one of the books I wrote was Art of the Con and you've been very kind Anthony 
to uh, get the word out on that. Great book. It's a great book, and it's a needed book. Obviously, every day in the news, uh, you read about, uh, unfortunately, another officer that's, uh, or another staff member that's been caught up, and uh, books like that are definitely needed, including the book you wrote, The Correctional Officer Practical Guy, which even though by label it says correctional officer, I believe it's very uh, well-rounded for anybody who's entering um, the corrections field. It's not just limited to uh, correctional officers. It's pretty much an understanding of corrections. So anybody, no matter what department you're in, uh, can benefit from uh, reading the text. Uh, but, but real quick, first, obviously, Gary, you've had uh, a, a, a great career. Uh, you're still doing uh, what it is. Uh, you're still doing stuff related to corrections. So obviously there's a heart in there. You didn't just retire and left. You know, you, you're you trying to make the field a little bit better, which is great. I mean, that's kind of what I do here. And we, we do these shows to educate. And um, I want to talk about your book for a little bit uh, first. And I want to talk about how your book is structured. Now, again, I enjoyed your book. I just got done finished reading it uh, earlier today. I actually finished, a, I had two chapters left. I finished that today, and, and, I, and again, now, it, it's, it's a textbook style format, so it, it, it kind of overwhelms you with just excellent information uh, that literally um, uh, can be applied, obviously. It, it's, it's not just, it's just, it's not just uh, information that you're going to not take with you. It's, it's not just classroom information. It's, 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 it really is information that could be applied uh, to the work we do every day, and you kind of give a great roundabout of the field, and, and, and you have the, the book uh, broken up into, I believe, 17 chapters, I think? Is 17 that what... chapters. Right, 17 chapters. So if I just may highlight some of the uh, chapters, it ranges from everything from simple definitions of the profession we're in uh, to um, different types of correctional facilities, uh, the history of corrections, uh, also um, personnel working in corrections training, uh, the development of modern correctional facilities, uh, talking about today's inmate. You also talk about the methods of handling special population, which is ever growing right now. That's the trend in correction. So the book you're reading is definitely up to date because a lot of facilities right now are dealing with special need inmates and they're, they're, they're not being trained. So this is a great avenue to definitely get some introductory reading on that. And hopefully your department will start implementing some training on dealing with special need populations. You also cover, again, just just uh, continue with that type of population, mentally mental disorders and suicidal inmates. You talk about physical plant and classification, which is classification is the backbone to a lot of facilities. I, I, would, I would go ahead and say that classification definitely, along with custody, sets the environment for safety and security. You also have security duties, uh, interacting with inmates, you know, remaining professionalism, uh, ethics, mental outlook, and stress, uh, stress. Then you talk about inmate violence, inmates' rights and needs, history of the courts and inmates' rights, and the 14th Amendment. This is great, too, because I noticed, Gary, that you do a class on uh, pretty much how not to get sued by an inmate. But let, let's just talk a little bit about the book. So did you structure the book uh, in a certain way because these are how you want your thoughts brought out? Like, first, you want to talk about the definitions. Then you want to go into, you know, pretty much what our responsibilities are, what is corrections about, stuff like that? Uh, yes, yeah, so the reason I structured it this way, and, and I, I have to, uh, I, I neglected to mention the, the publisher is Carolina Academic Press, which is a great, great publisher. Uh, Beth Hall, T.J. Smith, there's a lot of good folks down there, and my editor Alice Heiserman, uh, assistant on this book. But the reason I I wrote it was, I teach college classes in corrections. And I, I, I really am excited about doing that because, you know, you could bring to the college classroom the, the field because a lot of people do not know what corrections is. They don't know what uh, a prison officer does or a correctional officer does. I mean, you look at the movies and on television, it, it's a lot of cop-oriented. And I'm not knocking cops. They Like I told the rookies yesterday, they, the cops, the police... God bless them. They lock up the bad people. They get the bad people off the streets. But then they got to be kept somewhere, and the corrections officer keeps the bad people locked up so our citizens can sleep well at night and be safe. And that's an important part of the field. So when I wrote the, the first edition of this, I wrote back in the, I think it was 2000. The second edition was 05. And then uh, my editor, Alice Heiserman, and I got together and we thought, you know, there's a, so much information now. This field is changing so rapidly, so quickly. And um, so I wrote it for, for two groups of people. One, 
college students who want, who hopefully after they, they use the book or read it, might get the spark and say, hey, you know, this is a field I'd like to go into. And the second group of people are trainees. Now, not just just uh, uh, rookies, but anybody that, that uh, uh, does training, uh, well, but for rookies, new, new jail officers, uh, corrections officers, in an academy setting or in an in-service can use this book. And one of the things I'm working on right now is that the, uh, the book will have, if you adopt it for your course or training curriculum, uh, Carolina Academic Press will have available to you an instructor's manual. It has every, it has um, uh, multi, uh, a lot of test questions that you can use uh, in your classes with the, with the answers. And also each chapter will have a PowerPoint. It, uh, I'm, I'm almost done with the PowerPoints and that'll be available uh, very, very soon. So if you adopt the book and you use it for your class or an academy or a training program, you will be you will have a PowerPoint for each chapter, which uh, you know takes some of the load off the instructor um, and, and it, it will help them. But the reason I, I structured the chapters in that way, I wanted people to when they look at the book and they start reading it, what corrections is, what it does, what what the functions are. And then I wanted to talk about the different types of facilities because it's not just jail or prison. You have juvenile facilities. You have you have correctional facilities in Indian tribal nations. You have military facilities. You have uh, some facilities that are for geriatrics, older offenders. And then from there, I wanted – it's like I, you're going into the building, and then inside the building there are two groups of people. There's the corrections officers and staff, which I talk about the different duties – the formal roles, the informal, the informal roles, and then I talk about the inmate. And a lot of my observations and uh, and insight and experience I put into those uh, chapters. And then I get into things like uh, you mentioned inmate violence, uh, how to keep yourself safe, uh, manipulation. As you know, uh, we we we. You and I have done a lot on, on uh, combating uh, inmate manipulation, so there's a chapter on that. Um, and then I, I wanted to end the book with uh, well, special populations too, and um, uh, just just common sense uh, guidelines for working inside a correctional facility. And then um, I wanted to end the book with the rights of inmates. They have rights. They have rights. And it's not a bad thing because some some CEOs, well, they have too many rights. Well, there I I expanded the chapters on that, okay, uh, the last few chapters on that topic because I wanted the CEOs and the students to understand there's a reason that inmates have rights, and our correctional facilities, the training, the standards, and the way they operate, they're operating a lot better because the inmates do have rights. So those chapters kind of take a layman's view, not a, not a lawyer view, because I'm not a lawyer. But uh, being an, a, a veteran uh, correctional officer, deputy sheriff, I wanted to show uh, in the book that, you know, read how these rights developed and, and the reasoning for the courts. And they're not, it's not a bad thing for inmates to have civil liberties. Hey, okay. hey, hey, Gary, I agree with you 100%, uh, especially uh, on the administrative end. Um, seeing things, you got to make sure that those rights are not violated because you're looking at potential lawsuits, you know, uh, especially because the push now is to make sure that um, tr uh, jail is being done humanely. And, and that's actually, believe it or not, how we're keeping some of our um, practices like solitary confinement. I mean, you can't just put an inmate in an area and forget about them. You have to be aggressive yeah. with programming and you have to treat them in a manner that um, is respectful. Believe, uh, a, lot of public, a lot of people may not believe that, but it's true. It's respectful and attends to the needs of the inmate because, again, we're preparing them uh, for release in most cases. And I do believe that your book had a great flow to it because if I was new to the field, this is the road I would like to travel on because it really introduces me and it gives me a, a sense of what I need before I go on to the next chapter. Like you, it, it, it's a book that I really do. I, I think you, for those experienced, if they don't have time to sit down and, 
and read each chapter one by one. They could pick apart it, you know, based on what they need because there's definitely, a, a, uh, it could fulfill almost any need uh, for those in corrections. But if you're looking for a good flow of things and you're new to the field, uh, you could definitely see that the book is written in a manner where it introduces you to everything and the flow is very progressive. So by the end, you really do get a great understanding of, of, of what the book's about. But, but I got to ask you, with all this information uh, that this book provides, because guys, it really is rich with information, how do you research such a book like this? <laughs> it takes time. Uh, I, I, uh, people have asked me, you know, what is it like to write a book like this, especially, you know, a textbook? And uh, this is not my first, you know, rodeo. I've written other books. And I, I, I tell people, it's not what you see in the movies or TV that the writer sits down with his computer and he just he just starts spewing this stuff. I mean, you look, you do a lot of online research, do a lot of print material and research. And then I, I worked with a top-notch editor, Alice Heisman, and, and I would send her stuff and she said, oh, this, this doesn't sound right. Let's make it this way. And then she came up with sources. I think if anybody wants to get into uh, writing like this, it, it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and uh, uh, a lot of printouts on the printer, too. But, uh, but there's so much, uh, and you and I have talked about this, too, there's, there's so many good uh, resources now for corrections because when I started in corrections in the jail back in the uh, – uh, late 70s i mean we didn't have the internet uh and you had to go to uh, uh remember that building called a library <laughs> and you had to you had to sit down and you had to go through uh stacks of stuff and everything um you have to be careful when you research too because there are some people that 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 are online that do not understand what corrections is mm. they they have no idea like i told the um uh, rookie class or the newbie class yesterday, I said that you know that you're going to encounter people that that they don't know what we know, they don't see what we see, they don't do what we do, and you have to be very very careful. And I tell my college class this too: if you research things, and this is kind of the rule I follow, get your material from good good sources, objective sources, uh, and people that. Uh, that put stuff online, well-researched, well-written, and do not have an axe to grind, so to speak. Well, let me, um, let me add, I just want to go back on that. So, like, when someone that's reading the book right now, uh, you do acknowledge a lot of resources, a lot of references here. Um, yes, it's in, the, in the back, there's a lot of resources. Right, so if, if I was seeking to further my education on corrections, what would be some of the good resources for me to kind of venture through? Uh, okay, uh, I... I uh, uh, the Justice Center is, has good material. The Bureau of Justice Statistics. Uh, then you have Corrections One and some other sites that are good. Uh, uh, the Mer uh, some good magazines uh, and good good organizations. Because uh, uh, in the acknowledgments, there's a, a long list of people who helped me and released material to me. And, uh, uh, for example, the American Jail Association, Bob Kasabian, uh, the executive director, said, oh, yeah, you could use some of our material, American Correctional Association. They, they released some material that I included in the book uh, for, for, like, an escape plan, emergency plans, uh, things like that. And uh, also they, they released uh, uh, photographs to me. Uh, the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry, when I talked about programs, and, and I worked with those folks up at the Fairfax Jail, really good organization. They helped me. Um, International Association of Correctional Training Personnel, Randy Purdue from uh, uh, West Virginia, released uh, photos to me. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you go in the back of the book, you're going to uh, – uh, well, you should go to the acknowledgments first because there's people listed there and their organizations that, that you could go right online and take a look at what they have. And then if you go to the back of the book, uh, all of the uh, references are listed alphabetically. And throughout the book, um, I, I, uh, what I would do is put the source, the year, uh, and the page number. So let's say that uh, – 
that you're reading part of the book on special populations and uh, or legal rights, and you see the source, you go to the back of the book, you can find the source, and in the text I'll have the page number. You can go right to the page number and see where I got it. And so I, I did that to make it easier for both uh, the instructor, because a good instructor is going to back up what he said, he or she says. And the student, uh, because you know they have to do research papers, or even uh, a, an officer in an academy can say, okay, uh, I, want, I want more information on that. So the whole book is set up for an easy way to, uh, to find the information through the references. Now, I just, I just want to mention, guys, this is the third edition uh, to the Correctional Officer Practical Guide. That means there's been two other editions. So the books are written based on current trends in corrections. I'm sure when one was written, it was the great foundation. Then when there were certain changes, okay, now we got to write another edition. So now we have the third edition. So what changes are put into this book? Like, is there, um, like, again, corrections is always evolving. So what, what's different from the third uh, edition to from the second edition? What's funny is I, I, you know, as I do the show, uh, still trying to find that middle ground for correction. I really do feel that, um, unfortunately, uh, if it wasn't for people like us, uh, I really feel that corrections is a is a field that's somehow left behind uh, in regards to uh, public. Uh, I want to say sediment, if you will, or just in regards to public regard. Um, and and it's good to have books like this because it's not only to uh, educate us in the field, but there's also a chance that this is going to go to colleges and uh, affect people while they're young uh, when they're looking and when they're thirsty for that knowledge as opposed to uh, being influenced by people who take stuff out of context or not in the field who just automatically just um, bastardize the profession. So it's good to see um, that we have somebody with experience putting a textbook um, back into the schools to get these um, individuals when their mind's still, you know, they're getting their impressions, they're, you know, their mind is still formative, if you will. Now. Have, having said that, um, how do you feel when – now, have you, you – you taught at colleges too, so you, you've taught to students who aren't just – may not go into corrections, but just taking the course because it's going to give them some credit, correct? True. 
Yes, uh, at George Mason, which which I really love uh, uh, teaching, and this there and this fall I'll be doing a new course uh, on inmate management. So a lot of this I'm going to use the book for that course. But um, when I when I talk to the students, it's like the beginning of the semester, uh, and I'm not I'm not uh, deg- uh, degrading them or or uh, uh, I don't want to be condescending. But a lot of them, they don't know about corrections, so they sign up for the class to learn. Yeah, a lot of colleges uh, are heavy on police classes, and, I'm, and like I have said at the beginning, I'm not putting down the police, but that's what's most popular. That's what people hear about the most. Um, so when I talk to the students, uh, you know, I said, okay, throughout the semester, I'm going to give you the benefit of my experience, but we're going to have... Um, we're going to have guest speakers come in uh, from the uh, from the profession, people that I know from mental health, uh, from substance abuse, uh, uh, and they get a tour of the jail. Uh, they get a tour of the Fairfax Jail or the Prince William County Adult Detention Center, a great, great uh, institution down, uh, depending on the campus I'm on, what is jail I'm near, that, but I get them into, I get them into the jail, uh, a jail tour. Uh, I also show uh, factual videos uh, from news sources or correctional organizations. I say, this is what goes on in the jail. Some of the students that I have taught, I'll I'll hear from years later. And uh, uh, one became a deputy sheriff in Florida working in a jail. Uh, One of the students that I had just this past semester said he liked the class so much he, he's applying to be a correctional officer for the state of Virginia. And and uh, it, it, it really makes me feel good. Not I, I don't want to stand up in front of the class and say I'm an expert and I know it all because this field is changing so rapidly. Um, but, but it's nice to hear that young people have taken the class and I'm very blunt. I tell them the dangers. I tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly about the profession. And uh, some of them go into the profession, and I'll hear from them later, uh, saying, you know, telling me how they're doing. Um, I do think, I do think that colleges, and I'm going to be very blunt. I think colleges need to offer more in, in the way of corrections courses. Well, well, I'm not knocking. I'm not knocking police. I'm not knocking law enforcement. They're important, but hey, we're we're part of the criminal justice system as well, and I would like to see more courses taught by good instructors that talk about jails, prisons, inmates, and how to manage them. Because I tell my classes, you know, the CO, they're, they're going into a building. Could you imagine going into a building where the people that that are in the building don't want to be there, and everything that you try to do. Throughout your workday, they try to undercut it. Now you you take that and you imagine a twenty year career, twenty five year career, and I said so. People have to realize what corrections does. I think and you and I have talked about this, and I think one, one media exposure is good, and and it, and these shows to your talk, like what you have here is great. The colleges have to offer more corrections classes. And you know, to show to show the value, uh, 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 the the worthiness of our profession. Well, it, it's great that you you say that because, but be honest with you, when you read your textbook here, there's a lot of chapters here that could be a class. You know, the history of a uh, of corrections itself, uh, inmate rights could be a, a you could dedicate a whole semester to that because, as I say, it, it's just such a, a a broad topic. You know, and and again, it's very, it's very hard to get what's needed. Uh, out within an hour or two of, of what a class time would be as opposed to maybe devoting some more time like a, a semester towards it. But again, you know, corrections is always forgotten. And, and, and you know what's great, though, is when you see somebody with experience going back to academia to teach, that's great because you're, you're, you're given that perfect blend. And I, you know what's funny is I really do think that's kind of like the evolution of education right now is you're finding people that are experienced in their field going back and getting degrees and then go ahead and teaching um, uh, the students. See, see, my, my concern with corrections, again, and I know you mentioned this, and I'm trying to 
get a positive move forward for us. And it's very hard, believe it or not, because there's a painted picture of corrections that is very negative, but it's been consistently painted for many years. And the problem is, is if I go to present the proper view, it takes a lot for one entity to come up and say, wow, we must have been wrong all these years. So most of the time, the proper view usually gets pushed aside because uh, there's another motivated agenda, whatever that agenda would be. But we have to create a venue like this, like you mentioned, to get that proper view out because it's about time that correction starts contesting um, the negativity. Again, I had an issue recently about Rikers Island. There was an inmate in visits uh, that was receiving an oral favor from a female visitor. And the angle that the reporter wanted was pretty much blaming staff. And I said, okay, I'm not saying staff's perfect. You know, we got to look into that. But we also have to hold responsibility to the individuals, the visitor and the inmate who are taking advantage of institutional trust. And what I mean by that is there's a need to rehabilitate, but should not supersede safety and security. So when we look just to blame staff, it's unfair because we're trusting this visitor to come in and do the right thing. And we're trusting the inmate to take advantage of visits uh, in the right way. And then when they violate that trust, that should be noted. Like, is it, okay, may, I'm not saying staff's perfect. Maybe they missed it. Maybe they allowed it. I, I don't know, again, but we can't just look at the problem in an isolated manner. We have to say, okay, but there's context to it. Is it staff? Could be, maybe not. But I know two people who definitely are responsible, and that's the visitor and the um, and, and the inmate. And then the funny thing is, is again, just kind of co uh, community. When you, when you look at the evolution of, of corrections, especially, I believe it's chapter four and five of your book, uh, where you start talking about the history of... Um, Corrections, bear with me. Yeah, it is. Actually, I was right. Uh, four and five, history and the development of modern... You know what's funny? In, in my mind, it kind of mirrors, to some extent, uh, the history of psychology, which is my background a little bit. You know, I, I have a, a psych degree. Now, I'm going to tell you why. Be, uh, usually at the beginning of any science, of anything, it's, it's always one-sided, and then someone presents another side. Both sides stand in isolation until both sides say, wait a second, we would work well together. So in psych, you got the the uh, person themselves, you know, the introspective. You know, and then someone said, well, wait, what about the environment? So then for the while, the environment's standing tall. And then eventually someone says, wait, what about the person and the environment? Holy crap, you're correct. And now that's kind of where we're at now, situations and, and how it affects people and groups and, and a bunch of things. Well, same thing with corrections, believe it or not. Same thing with corrections. History had at first punishment. Let's punish the inmates, you know, whether it's like your book said, retribution or whether it's, you know, what, what is it? What, is, what would it be? Uh, an eye for an eye, um, you know, uh, yeah, revenge, revenge. Right. So and I'm sorry, the other one would be restitution, you know, money, property, whatever it is. But then it's like, you know what, this isn't working because the people got to get back out. So let's focus on rehabilitation, which has become a primary focus. It's become so primary, so so focused in rehabilitation that people have forgot. Wait a second. Hold on. There's still a punishment aspect here. There's still got to be that that deterrence. I mean, if punishment promotes deterrence, I mean, that's still a study that's got to be done. But having said that. There's still a punishment aspect because the person did do something wrong, but in the process, punishment can coexist with rehabilitation, which I believe now, again, we're still at that second phase where people think it's solely rehabilitation supersedes everything. Well, me and Gary have been doing the show long enough to tell people, wait a second, let's jump ahead of the eight ball. Let's not wait 20 years from now before people start seeing, wait, it's rehabilitation and punishment. Yes, let's be objective here. Let's 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 find a way where both worlds, because they do, guys, coexist. Prison, jail, a lock, whatever the case may be, but definitely more so prisons, because prisons, the inmates are there a little bit longer, but also jails. You know, you could hit things up early before they get sentenced uh, to a longer term. We need to rehabilitate, but that's not done in isolation of punishment, and punishment still has to supersede rehabilitation. The reason why is punishment deals directly with safety and security. They, they believe it or not, they're, they coexist. But Gary, do you believe that eventually, because it's not done now, that people will start seeing that rehabilitation and punishment do coexist? Yes, yes. And I think that uh, 
but and what we've t- you and I've talked about is getting getting information out to uh, through the media or through many different venues to John Q citizens that this is this is what goes on in the correctional facility. When I read uh, an article that say or I see an article that isolation is bad and the inmates suffer, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I saw inmates in isolation, and I would talk to them. i say, look, if you behave, we can get you out of here. We can try you back in general population. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't. But people have to understand that the CO puts their life, they put their lives on the line every day. And you, yes, you have isolation, but you have to have safety and security. Um, I'm a great believer in inmate programs. Uh, I mean, I I was a programs director for uh, uh, probably about one-third of my career between the uh, community correction side that I worked and the jail side. I I ran inmate programs and trained my staff and I trained volunteers and and so forth. But you have to understand that, okay, yes, you you just cannot throw rehabilitative programs at an inmate say, here, take them and it all is going to be well, you'll never come back in. The inmates, and, and, and that's why in the book I go into the culture of the inmates, why they commit crimes. You have to look at why they commit crimes, how they live their lives. Yes, if they want to change, if they want to change, programs will be a success. If they don't want to change, then you, you have to have safety, security, and some of them misbehave so badly, you have to put them in isolation. Well, it, it, uh, it, I know my college class, they, a lot of them ask, well, do you think people really like coming to jail? And I say, I have met inmates that are very, very comfortable. Yeah. You know, you know what's funny? They're comfortable by comparison. We have to remember, uh, we can't compare from our standards of living, you know, that jail is bad because our standards of living are different. I may have a good home, good family, uh, but they may have a different standard to compare from. And to their point, jail may be the better option. You know, we can't always, in our, or prison, our perspective is totally different than a life on the streets uh, being addicted to drugs. And I, I want to mention something. We talked about isolation. I did something with the Marshall Project recently. They were talking about death row inmates uh, being released in general population uh, because of the solitary confinement aspect. And I, I kind of redefined what my opinion is of solitary confinement. You know, not the primitive notion, but the more restrictive housing, the aggressive programming, um, the, the fact that they're not forgotten. It's not a crock pot. You don't just forget about them. They're, you know, we, we get at them aggressively, if you will. And, you know, we, we try to give them a chance to better their positions, you know, better themselves. But the problem is, and I, and I, and I got to say this, and I'm just saying this from a perspective, my perspective, you can't force rehabilitation on somebody and someone goes but you can force them into stuff and then they can see the errors of their ways and they'll change yeah but at that point you're no longer forcing them they're now they're willing so what i'm trying to tell people is is that you can't force rehabilitation on someone that doesn't want it so what i mean is you could force somebody into a class and maybe later on okay they decide to go with it but now it's no longer forced they're going with it I'm talking about the people that you're yeah, wasting. Sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah. I'm talking about the people that you force into a program, spending your money, you know, taxpayers' money, getting these programs off her, uh, out there, and they don't do nothing. They don't participate. They they don't get involved. And the problem here, or they could they could mess up the program. And the problem is, is if we don't do something with that inmate, we have hundreds of other inmates that we have to rehabilitate. Uh, that that could affect what they're trying to do, or takes up a seat. You know, so either way, when we remove that inmate, people got to start asking, why is that inmate being removed? What's so, why, why has it gotten to that point where that inmate has to be removed? But for some reason, when people worry about these issues, they're so focused on one inmate. And the problem is, is we can't be focused on one. We have to be focused on the many. So you can focus on your brother, your father, your mother, whoever it is. But we're not just focused on them. We're focused on the other 2,400 that still have to uh, get some time in with some good programming. So if there is somebody that's messing with that groove, I can tell you right now, the inmates will come to the staff and say, listen, you got to get this guy out of here because I'm trying to do something. Yeah. Right, and, and I think that somehow it's just not brought into the mainstream. And, and, and the problem here is that that's why it's important for shows like this. It's Listen, the show here that we do, and, and again, talking to Gary here too, is... 
It's not to say, hey, we're better than you. We to It's not that. It's just to inform because we believe that there's a lot of misinformation out there that's causing the public to not really understand the changes that they're trying to push or the changes that they're trying to back, you know, by those who've never worked in a correctional facility and to not go to people that are experienced to say, how can this be effective? Besides being rude, it's, it, it, it's, it's foolish because the people that uh, are going to be involved in the change, the, the officers that you or the, or the staff that you're trying to make changes that are going to affect them, they're the one where those changes pass or fail is dependent on them. If they don't understand the changes or they don't feel that they're a part of the changes, you're not going to get 100% out of them. I, I, I'm sorry, it's the truth. I believe in teamwork. I believe in empowerment. I, I, I believe that if we all got involved together, we could work together for a better system. And the reason why I'm saying this, Garen, I got to get your opinion on this, um, because your book really does highlight a change in correction. So when you're done reading the text, uh, I could just imagine if you ever do write a fourth edition, the changes that will be made uh, to that edition. So I'm trying to kind of jump ahead of the eight ball here. And what I mean by that is even by just me saying rehabilitation and punishment as opposed to rehabilitation or punishment is a jump ahead from both perspectives. From from the staff perspective, from the inmate perspective, believing that they don't coexist. Well, yes, they do. They do coexist. But having said that, when we, when we talk about the evolution of corrections, when we talk about where we have to go or how we're going to, most importantly, how we're going to better the field, I've been thinking about something, Garen. I want to get your opinion on this from a, profess a professional perspective and bear with me, okay, Garen, because this, this matters to me as a friend. Uh, you're a very good friend of mine. I respect not only your uh, experience in the field, which is just phenomenal. The stuff that you write, you ask me, what do I think? I mean, who am I really to even give an opinion? You know, you're, I, I could never write a book like you, but thank you for asking me uh, for an honest opinion. Uh, but you're also a good friend, you know, and, and I, I, want, I want to tell you about an, an idea that I have. Uh, it's, it's by no way self promote It's about for the field. So, so hear me out. And this is where these ideas get controversial because unfortunately the way the world works is you have to be extremely on one side or the other. There's no middle ground. And I've been really exhausting my mind on this. I, I really have. And I've been trying to think like, what am I doing wrong? How can I do a video that gets only a few hundred views or whatever? Well, we get a thousand views. I'm saying, but when we go live, uh, but an inmate can do a video from a cell phone in a cell and it hits thousands, you know, and then there's people, the sad part is this, is that there's people rooting for that inmate not to get the phone call. Hey, there's staff behind you. Hide the phone. Uh, the riot in Delaware, you know, uh, people from the public rooting for the inmates who took the uh, individuals hostage and later took the life of Lieutenant Floyd. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very backwards perspective for me. And, and, and again, I, I'm angry, but I'm also saying, well, maybe there's a misunderstanding. So maybe there's a better approach. So, again, being aggressive on one side versus the other, it's, it's not solving anything. So I said, you know what, Gad, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go left or right because I believe neither side at this point was working well with me. So I'm going to go in the middle and I'm going to stay in the middle, which is the road of compromise, you know, and see who's going to come into the middle. Well, guess what, guys? Nobody came. Okay, nobody came. So I said, okay, well, this ain't working either. You know, I'm in the middle here. Nobody came. So I don't want to go to the side that always looks like it's benefiting the inmate and screwing staff over. But the, the reason, but the other side that is usually like, like ultra respective for law enforcement and pushing for things that can help police are not helping corrections. I mean, in some states, they're pushing for corrections right to work. They're trying to destroy their unions. They're trying to privatize. So now I'm thinking, well, now if I have to go to a side, now hear me out. Um, maybe if you think about it, the side that's winning uh, when it comes to us is believe it or not, the, in, the the people that are advocating for inmates are really gaining a lot of ground uh, these last couple of years. I mean, literally, guys, if you notice that the stuff that's happening, uh, the, the push to end solitary confinement, and they settled for like the age groups, like the older, the younger, um, the, just, just the all around changes being pushed by LCL, uh, ACLU and stuff like that. These are changes that at first I'm looking at like, you know what? These are one sided changes that really hurt us. And when you go to explain those changes at an elementary level, no one could sit there and argue our point, against our point. They can't sit there and argue against our point because they know that we're correct. But having said that, we haven't really expressed our points well enough to that group because this group is seen as against us. And we see them also as 
as against us. But then again, I'm thinking like this. But they're really making headway, and we're still stuck here. We haven't moved. So is there a way that we can go to that other group on that side and say, you know what, your fate with those inmates is no different than our fate with those inmates. I sat down with Al, but it's true. Hey, Gary, I sat down with Al Sharpton. He said something key that day. I'm not a big fan of him. Don't get me wrong. But he respected me. He called us correctional officers. He let me say my side about staff and about privatization. He plugged his side about, uh, you know, inmate rights, which is fine. It's fair. You plug your side. I'll listen. If you respect my side, of course we're going to listen. It's constructive growth. But he said this, and it really got me thinking. Now, get forget about your thoughts about the man. Forget about it. Just think about the field for a second. He said there's room for advocacy on both ends. And I said, you know what? He's right. If we're losing this battle in the middle, and we are, and the other side's not doing nothing for us, we can easily remind this side that what you're doing uh, can be beneficial as long as you don't forget about us, the ones that are responsible for the kept. So what I'm trying to think now is... If I can't get a venue that wants to promote solely our concerns on a one-sided perspective, which is technically gone fair, I understand that, but it got to the point where we have to make up ground. So, of course, my perspectives are one-sided at first because we're so far behind the eight ball that I have to catch up before I can even think about talking about the other side. But what about if somewhere along the line we swallow our pride a little bit and start going to that side and saying, hey, what you want here, let me tell you how we can make it better so both parties can benefit. Because I'm going to tell you something. We're moving separate from each other, but we're behind and we're losing the battle. Gary? Uh, I think you're spot on. And, and a couple of things uh, came to mind while I was listening to you. Uh, one is that I think there has to be a communications bridge between... Uh, you say uh, inmate advocates, I, I, you could expand that into rehabilitation personnel, your program folks, and uh, the correctional officers. The correctional officers, and we have met them, we have met them, you know, you know and I know that they see a program's person, oh, it's a hug a thug, or it's, you know, they're trying to work with these guys, they'll never change. But they don't realize that, and when I do my trainings for volunteers and programs folks, and in my college classes, I tell them the programs have a very good place in a jail or a prison because it, 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 it brings something positive to the inmates. And there are inmates that don't want to change. But I think what the problem is sometimes is that the inmates uh, advocate or programs folks hear about correctional officers having sex with inmates, uh, the, the, the Clinton, New York escape where you had the CO uh, unwittingly uh, helped bring the contraband in. Well, the, uh, you're guys, talking about the, uh, the c civilian. The stereotype is up. You mean the civilian, then, right, Joyce Mitchell? Yes, and then, then you have uh, the COs uh, see a lot of inmates come in over and over and over. Now, you got to be realistic, okay? And I would like to see good... CEOs, good representatives of the field, talk to groups. Get there should be a PR campaign in every department, every department. And I, I know in Fairfax we have a, a good public uh, relations uh, uh, staff, and they will go to the county fairs and they will set up. They do things in the community. That should be above. That should be across the board everywhere. The people, when they see a correctional officer or they go past the jail, they look at it as a professionally run uh, 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 facility. Uh, I do think media appearances are good. I think you have to get the politicians involved. I think when, when there's a bar association meeting, let's say in, in a large county like Fairfax, uh, I remember going to a bar association meeting and telling the lawyers what we do. And it, these things have to... They have to happen. They have to happen constantly. And then uh, I'm going to go back to the college. Uh, you know, pe kids come out of high school. They go into college. Well, let's have corrections in the colleges. Let's have it at the job fairs. Uh, you, you're right. 
You're, you're exactly right. And we it seems at times that you and I read where the inmate programming uh, folks, the people that believe in rehabilitation, and many inmates do want to become the, the good citizens. I've met inmates, and you have too, that say, hey, I'm tired of this crap. I don't want to come back in. You got programs that can help me, and my job was, yeah, you got this, you got this, you got this, you can you can do this, and then, but we have to have COs realize that not ev- not all the inmates are are resistant to change. There are some that really want to change, and so in the book, I go into being a role model, uh, being the uh, there's informal roles of the CO. Uh, one of them is counselor. Inmate has a problem. What can I do? You're not going to solve the problem for the inmate. No. The inmate has to take on a lot of the responsibility to solve the problem themselves. Okay, but there has to be there has to be a PR campaign. There has to be uh, widespread exposure. Uh, I am, I would call up, uh, upon every superintendent and sheriff. Uh, that is that is listening to invite the the, uh, uh, the, the, the inmate advocates in, take them on a tour, show them what the COs go through, Sh- tell them, uh, show them what the deputy sheriffs go through when they have to work a floor or work inside the jail, and then I, I believe in cross training. We haven't talked about that, but I, I do believe, and I, I mentioned it in the book, but cross training. Where when people are hired to work inside the jail in programs, have them spend some time with the deputies, go to roll call, see see what the squads talk about, and then when you have people coming out of the academy as part of their on the job training or OJT, have them spend some time with some programs folks. Fairfax, uh, they, they rotate the uh, the, uh, the newbies, the rookies through the different sections. I think they still do that, but the, until these things happen. Until these things happen, it's going to be like in, in the old uh, movie spot, World War One. you know, two, two uh, camps staring across no man's land. And, no, and nobody's willing to go out and, and handshake with the other. Well, see, that's, I know, I, I, I know it's tough because you're going to have those that want to be aggressive on one end. But the problem here is that I believe, uh, you know, the whole time I've been trying to push our ideas to the public, get the recognition that we need. And, and I was trying to do it from the outward in. And I think I was doing it wrong. I think I, I need to go from us first and go from inward out, you know, because if we have a love for what we are and we fight for what we do, then we can manifest that outwards. Uh, and I, I've been I've been doing it wrong. But again, I was the first of my kind um, to try to get some recognition. So even like entities like Corrections One, great entity. Uh, definitely if you're looking to educate yourself, but it's really geared towards us. It's geared to those who work in corrections. Uh, not really very much for those on the outside um, uh, trying to look in. It, it, it's more of our knowledge, you know, because it's written by yes, us. But I, I would like to see, I just thought of this, um, I, I would like to see media broadcasts of what we do uh, uh, and what we go through and the training and so forth. But the only time we seem to see that stuff is when there's a problem in a prison or jail. Well, that's because, uh, besides the fact that it being consistent with what the public believes, it's what they consider entertaining. And most of the time, it's not entertaining. It's it's, it's a very mundane job. But having said that, you know, there's still um, a lot of information that's not out there that really does need to get out there. And there's got to be a venue for that because it, it, it's... People will say the system is broken. It's, it's not broken, and you're hypocritical because when a problem happens, you're calling the broken system that you say is broken. So so, so the point is, deep down inside, no one could sit there and say they don't need the system because that they they know it. You're fighting for someone on an individual level by, by generalizing failures of, of a system based on extremes that are really maybe specific to that one individual or that one facility or, or whatever the case may be. And, and now using that extreme as a way to say it's everyone. And, and it's not because a lot of people that are professional are going to come up and say you're wrong and we're aggravated because you're, you're, you're bastardizing a profession that gets little or no recognition uh, for anything positive. You know, we talk about one negative action. Like, you know, uh, I'll read the newspaper. One negative interaction from one officer somewhere 
whoever the case may be. Well, that's great. That's one officer, one negative interaction between an inmate. Well, me alone, in an eight-hour day, I've had thousands of interactions with inmates. So, you know, you know, we're going to have, you know, once in a while, those that stray. But when the person does something wrong, why is it that it's the uniform first, then the individual? It's backwards. Okay, it's backwards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, it, I think people have a tendency to to lump all of us into um, into a stereotypical view. Uh, like some of my students, I said, "Well, yeah, what do you know about prisons?" So, and and movies come up. You know, Shawshank Redemption, always, which is a great movie. Yeah, it's, it's a movie. It's a great movie. But I said, not all corrections officers are like that uh, brutal captain and the uh, crooked warden in Shawshank Redemption. I said. How about the Green Mile? How many people have seen the Green Mile? I said, okay. I said, did it show a humane side of the CO? Yes. Did it show that the COs treated the inmates like people? And, you know, this this communications gap has to be bridged. It, it really does. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're watching things and, and you see, you know, watching prison movies and people are voting for inmates and then you're watching a, a riot happen in Delaware and people are rooting for inmates, you're on the social media and... Inmates are using cell phones, uh, videoing whatever the hell yeah, they're videoing. And, 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 and the CEOs that allow this, we have to weed them out. Well, see, so that's... When I, when, I, when I read about a, a CEO having sex with an inmate and they're fired, I, I feel no sympathy for them. And if I, uh, if I read about a CEO or, or, or like the Clinton uh, New York escape, the, 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 uh, the CEO and uh, Joyce Mitchell that were... Uh, Involved. Uh, instrumental in bringing this stuff into the inmates, and they've lost their career and their family, and she lost her freedom. Uh, Eugene and, Palmer. And he lost, uh, and the CEO lost his retirement. Uh, I, I have no sympathy for them. I don't. Nope. And but there should be kind of a media blitz when these things happen. There should be a lot of people in our field going out saying, we're not all like this. We're not all like this. Well, you know, you know what's funny, Gary. You're 100 percent correct. And I'm going to tell you something. Most likely, I'll be doing a show like this for many years. You'll see me age. My hair will go gray, and <laughs> and we'll still have the same perspective. And then one day, when Maybe I'm long, bald is not all that bad. Well, no, I'm going bald. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying, but you know, one day, what's going to happen here is we'll be long gone, and we'll be the per hey, hey, ain't this crazy? We just found out these, I uh, found these lost tapes of a show called Tear Talk, and. Uh, this kid, Anthony and Gary, uh, but 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 at the end of the day, I know you got to ga go, Gary. I just want I want to finish the thought real quick. That's important, if I may. And um, at the end of the day, I, I think the problem with us uh, moving forward, honestly, is that a lot of us will talk at work and and, and kind of leave it at work. And the people that fight for the other side, it's their life. You know, they're fighting more aggressively and more consistently. You know, uh, in regards to the time that they're devoting to it, where us. Eight hours, it's, you know, we do the eight hours, in some cases 12 or 16, and then we go home, and then it's our, our, our life again, and then we go back to work and start bitching and moaning again, but we really make no effort to travel out unless it's about pay and incentive, which is great. We, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing, we need better pay, but the problem is, what people don't realize, and, I, and I'm trying to say this, and I don't understand why this is so hard for people to understand, is that you want that. But you also got to get recognition for who we are so people yes. will decide to pay us more. Like the word guard, not to minimize or negate, it has a history. I respect the history. No one's going to pay guards the salary you want. They're going to pay officers that. And that's public perspective. You know, I mean, that's how they view officers. Again, we know how we view a guard. We know how... You know what, what, what? You know how we feel about that perspective. We know the importance of that position and that label, but that's our knowledge. Someone that doesn't know what we do is only going to see a guard as someone that steals idol in, in, a, in a in a facility that doesn't move, that's not fluid, and we know that's not true. We're officers that stand that stand in an environment that's forever moving, that that really promotes interaction. On a deal, especially if you're in the prison setting, you know, where, you know, the, the, the gates are open, inmates come out, and they get programmed, you know, and there's constant interactions uh, that really do enforce professionalism, but also our law abide, our lawful responsibilities, you know, the, the, the law enforcement role of, of what we do in corrections. So what I'm asking here is this, and again, we'll come and close and I'll get, you, I'll get your finished thoughts real quick, is, is corrections is evolving, Gary's book can kind of show that, read first and second edition and see where we're at with the third edition. You're going to see 
a, an evolution towards a direction that I really do think we can see. Those with experience kind of know uh, where corrections is going. Uh, if it continues to go this way and rehabilitation supersedes safety and security, it's not positive. But if it goes where there's a balance of both, but definitely safety and security is um, the controlling factor that creates that balance, well then guess what, guys? That's a direction that we could be a part of. But again, it's a fight that goes beyond our 8 to 12 hour, 16 hour tour of duty and also beyond uh, us. It means an interaction with the community, uh, a, a, an interaction with a bigger venue that also uh, stretches past corrections and, and, and law enforcement issues. But if, unfortunately, if we're not willing to once, a, want, once in a while make a sacrifice, maybe even get a degree and go back and teach at the schools uh, to get those formative minds when they're young, then please, all I'm asking is this. For those that do and make that attempt, don't negate, don't minimize, because they're sacrificing a lot of hard, they're sacrificing their personal time, they're putting a lot of hard work and effort to put change into a field that they believe in, and if you want to sit there, again, it's not personal, not, not something I'm, I'm reflecting off of, but if you want to sit there and bastardize that individual who went to school to get a degree from the field, worked the field, went to school, get a degree, and hopped in the admin, and you want to bastardize him for going to school, you're the fool. Because he's creating or she's creating a difference by bringing experience up. And what I'm asking for it right now is that we need more people right now from the field to help promote a better picture of the outside, uh, to the outside of what we do. And if we're not willing, if you're not willing to do that, then step aside. I would say, Anthony, it, it, like I, I said a few minutes ago, you're spot on. And I also think this has to be a multi-faceted or multi-level approach. Uh, each of the, each of those, listen, each of you listening that, that are wearing the badge, wearing the uniform, and you're walking into that building every day, every shift, with people that don't want to be there and some that hate your guts, do what you can to get the word out about your profession. Yes. Go to your go to your kid's school career day. Offer to talk to a civic group. Offer uh, to talk to uh, church groups, social groups, um, uh, Rotary clubs, whatever. Because if if more of that is done, little by little by little, mind by mind, the Im our image will change. Yep. And some people think, Gary, that, you know, do I think about work? Yeah, I do in a, in a positive way, but I do. But people are like, well, that's not healthy. Yeah, you know, but it's also not healthy going into an environment every day that you don't like, that you don't try to change. So there's yeah. always going to be that balance. And some people are well, going to have to make that sacrifice. That's, that's true. Because my, my next project is the uh, third edition of my book, Stressed Out. And uh, it, I remember burnout days. I remember. And it, it I. I know a lot of folks are listening, they're tired, and some days they go to work, and why am I here? But you're still part of a noble profession. Don't let it get to you. I agree. I don't want to have to push through every day upset. You know, I want to try to, you know, yeah. get through the day yeah. and, and smile because I've succeeded. Hey, uh, so anything in closing you want to say to the audience? Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you having me on to talk about the book. Uh, the book is called The Correctional Officer, A Practical Guide, third edition. It's available from the publisher, Carolina Academic Press. You could go to www.cap-press.com. You could also go on Amazon.com. You can Google my name on Amazon uh, Books. I, the book is not on my author's page yet, but if you Google the book on Amazon, Correctional Officer Practical Guide, third edition, it, it will come up. Uh, I know the publisher has talked to uh, the American Correctional Association about carrying the book, and I also have written to Bob Kasabian at the American Jail Association uh, about carrying the book. Uh, I hope those of you who are listening, I, I wish you well, God bless, be safe, uh, and give your, your loved ones a hug when you, when you go out the door and when you come home. And also, if anyone 
it does get the book personally i really appreciate that uh anthony i'd like to give out my email uh get some feedback yeah go ahead if that's okay mm-hmm. you can reach me by email at adj that's a is in adam d is in david j is in john adj instructor so it's all together adj instructor at hotmail.com and i'm also on linkedin so if any of you are on linkedin you can go and, and google me on linkedin and uh my uh my uh, uh, page will come up, and I have to update the page. I'm going to do that this weekend about the book and, and everything. So, All right, Gary, with, by before the end of the night, I'll send you a copy of the video. And what I'll do is in the video, I'll put your email in there. Okay. When okay. I uh, appreciate that. God yeah, bless course. everybody listening. Be safe. Be well. Hug your loved ones, and remember, you're part of a noble profession. All right, I love you, Gary. I love you too, buddy. All right, bro. Take you care, take man. Take care now. You too, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, so I thought it was a great show. We talked about we supported one of our fellow uh, officers from the field who made a book, uh, Correctional Officer Practical Guide. I love the book, and I'm supporting him because he's from the field. That's experience right in this book. Uh, and I thought we also try to, con- you know, discuss some concerns. I wanted, to, I wanted to focus on his book a little more, but I wanted to also express what I'm trying to do, which is kind of seeing where we can find a ground and move forward. Again, my, my sole mind is you guys who risk their lives every day. So as always, guys, it's... it's Pleasure talking to you guys. My name is Anthony Ganger. The show is Tear Talk. Please subscribe, comment, YouTube channel, guys. Let's get followers, thousands. If no one wants to give us the venue, then we create the venue. And that's what we're doing. Tear Talk.